was good to see them home. Um, I have missed you uh, tremendously. The sermon series that I've been preaching is the third interval. We're in the uh, in the in the passages, and we well, I'm not going to go back and review because, like I said, I've got a lot of information to cover. But in this interval, we're not seeing a chronological order of things, but things that we are going to see happen, or as we've seen in the other intervals, maybe a a that big word parenthetical or in parentheses, an event that takes place. And we're seeing right now in this third interval, we're seeing these angels. They're, you know, there's the first three that give the warnings, but there's actually six different angels we'll see in the next little bit. Uh, but the second angel, and I'm going to read the passage again. Another angel, a second, uh, followed saying, uh, if you remember followed, what did they follow? Going back three weeks ago, we're following another angel that flew around, given the gospel. You remember we spoke three weeks ago about this angel that gave the gospel. That was the first time an angel had been used. God had always used man. And we look back and remember a, a in this interval, we look back to something that has just been previously said uh, to bring us up to a place that we can answer that. And if you will go back into your uh, Bible, you hopefully you got your Bibles open. Uh, your electronic device, whatever the case may be. But in Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 13, verses 5 through 8 said this, And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It, opens its, it opened its mouth and uttered blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. That in itself is scary enough. And we see that war going on today. It's not just in Revelation. It's also today. And if you're, if you're honest with yourself, you know that we're in a battle. And the passage goes on. And the authority was given it to over the tribe and people and languages and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. We look back in this interval and I've titled my sermon, The Fall. The Fall. And we see those words, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. This warning that we see from the angel, y'all have to bear with me. I have to catch my breath over a little bit, okay? Um, this angel, as he gives this warning, he says, he speaks it as if, if it's already happened, and it hasn't yet. Uh, and that's one of the things I wanted to acknowledge to you right now. I'm not going to get into the fall and fall in this battle in the great. We are going to spend chapters 17 and 18 going into very much depth of what actually happens and how the fall of the government, the world society, and the church, the prostate church, uh, that is what he's, this angel's talking about. Fallen, fallen. Those things that have caused us problems, caused us such grief, they're going to fall. The victory will be ours. Hallelujah. But to understand the reason why this even has to be in context and in the scripture and even the reason why we have the book of Revelation to let us see the wrath of God for those that have gone against God's word and his will for our lives and what it was he made us for and why he wanted us here. And because we took our eyes off of the Lord and placed it on ourselves, we see a fallen generation. And that's what I want us to do is lay the groundwork with this. My, like I said, the title of my sermon is The Fall. I believe to go back and to look through history, we need to do that to better understand why this all transpires. The fall is not news to us. Those of us who are in church, we read the Bible. We know all about it. But do we understand it? Do we truly understand it? I want us to consider something today. What do I know about the fall? Now, I'm not talking about Babylon. I'm not talking about this time in Revelation. But about the fall. 
our fall, man's fall, society's fall, the church's fall. What do I know about it? A lot of us, we go to church and we hear the stories how sin came in. We know the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But I believe sometimes we lose track of what it is that he would have us to understand. Do I understand the fall of, uh, from God's kingdom that is recorded in history? Do we have a rooted foundation in which we can understand better this word fall? Are we allowing the Antichrist of today to sway our understanding of the kingdom of God? That's one of the things I say a lot of times. We're not building a church here. It's a byproduct of what we're doing, but we're building the kingdom of God. Amen. We're trying to bring people into the citizenship of heaven and get back to the place that we go back before the fall and get back to where it is that God created us. And that was for his kingdom that he might have time with us. Whose kingdom are we ambassadors for? That's a question only you can answer. What am, are you an ambassador for the kingdom of God? Or are you an ambassador of what you want? And a lot of times Christians, they lose sight of what the kingdom of God is all about. They want to stay on what it is that I, you know, they, they look at their church, me, myself, and I. Are we ambassadors for the right kingdom? And are we listening to what God's word says about God's kingdom and the world's kingdom? We like to, sometimes we quote scripture. Sometimes we listen to things that other people say. We have key little phrases we have. You know, Instagram has them. Not Instagram, but uh, what's that other place? Pinterest. You know, you can always find what you need on Pinterest. A little saying, a little verse that's been clipped. To fit a situation that puts a twist that we can say it's okay to do the things I do. But our kingdom is set by a set of rules. That's why we have God's word. And to understand the fall, we have to go back, way back, and figure out each step as we see the fall. Uh, we've got some visitors here and, or some people who haven't been here in a while. If you look on the back of your bulletin, I have my outline. Write down the things that God lays on your heart. Lay down that one or two words. Don't try to write everything I say. But if the Lord speaks to you about something, write it down. Just something that will make you go back and read that. Okay? But the first point I want us to look at is the fall of man. The fall of man. To better understand the fall of man, we must go back to the beginning. In the beginning. We go back to Genesis, right? And we want to ask this question. What was man's job? God created man and woman, but we go back to Genesis chapter 1 in the beginning. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, now here's where we get it. Here is what it is that man has been challenged by God himself. This is what I want you to do, Adam, Eve, human, mankind. In quotes, it says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Sounds like a pretty good time, don't it? I mean, just go out there, reproduce, grow, and just make this place big. It's my kingdom. I want you to have a part in it. I need you to fill my kingdom. I need you to have dominion and rule. Isn't that what we really want today? We want to be in charge, don't we? And that's what God gives us. That's why it's in our nature to want to be in charge of everything. But he said, I need you to do it this way. He didn't say nothing about himself. And I don't believe that work was a bad thing back then. I believe they wanted to get out and do things. Go get some food and go, you know, all the herbs and all the trees and all the fruit and all that. And we find there real close to that little passage where God said not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But we see what it is that God wanted man to do. That was man's job. But we lost sight of that. And that's the reason why we have the fall. When man, when did man fall from the place of God's kingdom? We go to Genesis just a few chapters later in Genesis 3, starting with verse, four, uh, verse 1. Now the serpent, Satan, if you will, the devil, that fallen one, the dragon that we've talked about, 
He showed up. He was already doomed and he showed up and he started talking to Eve. And it says, he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree and eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. She's already twisting the truth there. But the serpent said to the woman, and this is, very, this is very important that we get this. He lies to her and he gives heresy. He changes her way of looking at what God has already said. He says, you will not surely die. He loves you too much. Don't we hear that today? God loves us too, many, too, too, loves us too much to send us to a place called hell. He says, surely you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of, the, eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Knowing good from evil. And then there's that big, you ever notice that two letter words usually have big emphasis? So, circle that in your Bible. After what he said, she started analyzing. She started figuring it out. What it is that I want I need to figure out what it is that he's said and what God has said, and I want to make sure that I'm going to do what I want. We read the passage, and it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. When we take our eyes off of what God has told us, you're on shaky ground, ladies and gentlemen. When you start trying to analyze and saying, I can do this, it feels good, and God's word will even back me up, and we take something out of scripture, out of context, and we use it to give ourselves that authority or that covering, that protection to go against God's word. That's what Satan wants us to do. And he will draw us away. See, so we need to stop following the lies of Satan and start standing on the word of God. If you've got a question in life, you're going through something, you've got to make a decision, go to God's word. Find out what it is that you need to do. What is it that you're doing for ministry for God? What is it that you do during the week that helps to grow the kingdom of God and uplift your fellow man? That's a question only you can answer. I mean, I can sit up here and give you a to-do list. I'm sitting here trying to figure out the things I need to catch up on over the last three weeks. Everybody says, just take it easy. Just take it easy. But you see, the kingdom needs our help. Now, God could do it all himself. I know he could. But he, he wants to include us in his kingdom. He wants to use us. Uh, had a small group meeting over at uh, Andy's last night at 6 o'clock. If you're not doing anything on Saturday nights at 6 o'clock, show up at Andy's. Every Saturday night at 6 o'clock. It's not every other. It's every Saturday night right now at 6 o'clock. We had a good time. He had a, Cheryl had a big old pot of pinto beans. And we had some tortillas and green chilies. Oh, my goodness. I had a time. But we studied God's word. And we saw that how God wants to use us. Learning, learning the book of James. We got to get our eyes off of us. And start looking at what God would have us to do. You see, at that point when he did this, Satan knew that he, he had got the hook in. And that was when the line was drawn in the sand in Genesis 3.15 when God got there and, he, and God was confronting Adam, Eve, and S Satan. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. See, Satan knew at that time that his kingdom would fall. He knew that Babylon would fall. He knew that they, he didn't have a chance. And I imagine he scratched his head and wondered why God just didn't take care of him then. So we need to be understanding that he's going to slither his way all through our lives and try to get us to take our eyes off of the truth of God's word. And when he does that, that's when we start falling as men and women. I'll guarantee you when you fall into temptation... You know, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, write that down. 
you, there hath no temptation taking you, but as such is common to man. But God is faithful who will not tempt you above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. See, if Eve had turned around and told Satan, said, God said this, go on your way. Everything would have been okay. Temptation is not the problem. It's when we fall and go into that, that place that we shouldn't go and that we go against God's word that we sin. And that is when we fall. Peter told us something that we should have and we should uh, learn and, and try to keep in touch with. In 1 Peter chapter 5, we read, but be sober-minded and be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. We all know that verse, right? Seeking someone to devour. And then the next two words we forget. Resist him. Put your hand up. Don't you like doing that? No, stop. Judy don't like it when I do that. I don't do that because she hits me. <laughs> Resist him. Firm in your faith. You can't resist if you don't know what you believe, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. Read God's word. And then when you know that that temptation is there, you say, where's my way of escape? I'm using God's word to help me battle Satan himself so that when I'm tempted, I don't have to fall. I can sit there and quote scripture. I can look to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't know what to say. I don't know the scripture I need to go to, but Lord, protect me. You know what he will? He will give you what you need. And he will give you that still small voice. And he will tell you what you need to do. But you got to slow down and quiet down and let him speak so that you might not fall. Amen? Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. That verse goes on to say this, and this is what I love. If we can stand and follow what God says, he says, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his, his eternal glory in Christ, so praise the Lord, we're going to get to Jesus. We have Jesus. He made a way. And he says, will himself restore confirm, strengthen, and I love this, establish you. You want to be a thorn in Satan's side? Let Jesus establish you. Let your ways be his ways. Let your desire be to fulfill God's sovereign and perfect will for your life. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Let the purpose in which God has you here in 2022 Romans 8, 28. Let it be for his purpose, whatever the case may be. You see, you're here for a reason. And it's not to fall, ladies and gentlemen. You see, we give in to Satan and when we give in to him that temptation and we go along our way and we feel our desires, our needs and whatever it is that we think is important, that we take our eyes and ears off of what God's word says. That is when we fall. Mark it down, the fall of man. Secondly, we want to look at the fall of society. You see, if we understand that Jesus is going to take and restore us, confirm and strengthen us to establish, that makes us ambassadors for the kingdom of God. Now, ambassadors for the kingdom of God means that there's a society that's involved with this. We're to point to Jesus, our king, but to the kingdom of God. See, the next thing to happen is we're going to be raptured out. That's the next prophetic event in which we will see Jesus in the sky. And we're going to be raptured out. And we know that, but, you know, just like the three wise men came to Bethlehem looking for the king of the Jews. It was in scripture. It was told that he would return. We know that Jesus is coming back. Amen. Amen. Isn't that what he said in Matthew? I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. And he says, if I go and prepare a place, guess what? I'm going to come back and get you. Amen. Are you telling others about that? You see, that's when we have to include not just ourselves as individuals, but we've got to reach out into our circles, into our communities, and into the world and give the understanding that God created us for a kingdom. And we have this wonderful blessing that he has promised us. 
But the fall of man, we can go back, fall of society, we can go back to the beginning as well. In Genesis chapter 9, man's job stayed pretty much the same. We've seen everything kind of goes crazy. And Noah, God says, build an ark. And we know Noah and his three boys and their wives. So there's eight people on the ark with all these animals. I still wish he'd have just killed them mosquitoes and, and ants. Amen. But anyway, we see them as they get off. God has kind of said, okay, we're going to reset here. And we're going we're to get back to the way it needs to be. And I'm going to tell you what you need to do, uh, Noah. Isn't it amazing that God always tells us what we need to know? But in chapter 9, it says this, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful. See if this doesn't echo what we read in chapter 1. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creepeth on the ground and the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Sounds exactly like what he told Adam and Eve. And he goes on to add, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Now you don't just have to eat the, 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 the greens, the salads. Some of you ladies still like to stick to that diet. I like meat. I'm a meat eater. And he says, everything that moves is now food for you. And as I have give you the green plants, I give you everything. The job has not changed. He's actually added to it. He says, I'm going to give you some meat now to eat. You can have t steak and taters. Amen. He gives them everything now. And, and there's not a restriction on that. And it's just... If it's there, it's, it's yours. You have dominion. Our job is the same. We need to live our lives that God is using us, that we can have dominion over his kingdom, that we can show the society that we need to live according to his will. But every society is often is a great reflection of the leader. Society is a, a reflection of the leader in which is placed over them. In Genesis chapter 10, we continue in that story there after the flood and all that. And we start in at verse 8. Cush fathered Nimrod. How many of you have ever heard of Nimrod? Okay. That's, I'm, I'm surprised with that. A few hands came up. But Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, he began of his kingdom was Babel. Eric, Achad and Selni in the land of Shinar. Long story short, Nimrod was a great hunter. And I believe that God always, those that are in charge, supply for the society that's around them. So this great hunter, you know, they, he give us the, the animals now. So he would supply the needs of the society of that group. Or as it even says here, these, these cities and whatnot. But it says his beginning of his kingdom. Nimrod's kingdom. How many of you ever heard of the Tower of Babel? Nimrod was the one that started all that. You see, because of that reflection on the air, Nimrod recognized, was recognized by the Lord as a leader. It says it right there in the word. As a great hunter, he was a leader. He was supplying for the people in his community, his society. And he saw him as a leader. You know, I just want to ask you, are you a leader in your society? Are you leading people to Jesus? Are you telling them about the kingdom of God? You see, if you're going to be a leader, you need to understand where it is that you're leading to. And that's where we fall sometimes. And that's the reason why we need to learn from Nimrod. See, what Nimrod did is, it, it, you know, we're going to shorten this and condense it a lot because there's a lot happens here. Uh, but those with a voice who are in leadership, often, sometimes, they'll sit there and start listening to that, their own voice, just like Eve did in the garden. And they start leading their people in a direction that God had never intended for us to go. As a matter of fact, we've already read that he said to have dominion over the earth and cover the earth to ref refill it, to make it a place, a kingdom, a society. But Nimrod said, you know, I just really don't want to go all over the world. And what the scripture says is that now the whole earth had one language and, and, and the same words. 
And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Started doing what God said. They said, we're going to just dig in right here. And it says that they said to one another, come, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. We know how to make brick from this. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower that is uh, its top into the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. You see, Nimrod started leading in a direction that was his idea. That was his plan. That was his idea. And he felt that he could even reach God by building a tower. And God recognized this. And he says, you know, he's, uh, you know, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, they're sitting there and they're having a conversation. So, you know, they're getting a little out of control down here. If we don't do something, they're going to continue on this path. And what, you know the story, that's the Tower of Babel. And what it is, is the Lord came down and confounded their language. And he said, that's where we get Japanese, Chinese, Portuguese, and all them cheeses. And we, we understand all these languages. And that's where it happened. And that's how it changed. Because they understood one another and they could converse in that society. We come together in strength and harmony. And of our own accord, and we're going to do what we want instead of what God wants. Isn't that kind of how the world's messed up today? And that is the problem that we see our world as we go further into society. And I'm going to just, this is, this is me. This is me. It's not in the Bible. But as God confused their languages, I believe as we come closer, you know, there was a time, and I believe it still is, if uh, I know many missionaries that are in China and other foreign countries that are restricted to the gospel, but they want Americans to come and teach them how to speak English. You see, that language is coming back to a place that they, we can all understand one another a little better. And we can get to tell, and that's, that's part of Satan's plan, the Tower of Babel, to reverse that. And get to the place that we can all come together, speaking one language under one rule, one, one world government. Isn't that what the beast is all about? And the false prophet. So as we look at this, we see that Nimrod, he has led them. And again, we see the fall of society because man has taken his desire of self and made it more important than God's words. You know the rest of the story. They were dispersed all over the world, just like he wanted them to do anyway. Babel, as I've talked about, is also, if you get into the Hebrew, I'm not going to get into all this. We'll talk about this at another time. But Babel and Babylon are the same place. Like I said, you'll have to come back when we get to chapter 17 to get the rest of that. Again, Peter tells us something that we need to listen to. As a society and as people, we need to listen to God's word. And we can listen to this today. 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for those uh, his own possession, that's God's possession, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you were, did not have mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners, and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Stop listening to the devil and his lies. Stop listening to the lies of society. Listen to God's word. If you've got a question, like I said, nail it down with God's word. Get back into God's word. Study God's word. Memorize God's word. That way when it does happen, you can sit there and say, uh -uh, uh -uh. God's word says this. And this is what we're going to do. God's word is always true. If you have a question between God's word and what man says, let me tell you, go with God's word. You'll win every time. Amen? Yeah. There ought to be some amens there. We have to understand what we believe and who we believe and how we're going to get to that place. And God has given us his word. God has given us his Holy Spirit to understand his word. That being said, we also we see the fall of man, the fall of society. Point three, the fall of religion. We know, and as we've studied Revelation, we have the apostate church. But I'm wrapping it into religion because that is the word that the world knows today. And again, we go back to, it actually started there in Babylon. 
or Babel. We'll get into that later. But as we go to Exodus chapter 20, God finally, instead of telling us, because, you know, sometimes we just, we don't hear real good. He decided he'd write it down for us. He said, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a graven image, a carved image, or a likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, and that is the water or under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Boy, if we'd listen to that. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the children and the third and the fourth generation of those that hate me. But show yourself, showing steadfast love to thousands of those uh, who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name uh, of the Lord your God in vain. The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. God finally wrote it down on the tablets, the Ten Commandments. The whole first half of the Ten Commandments is how God wants us to look at God. Stop taking our eyes off of the world. Look to God and see what it is. And we can have His Word. You say, well, I don't have the Ten Commandments in front of me. No, you've got something far greater. You've got the Word of God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. In the Word, what? Was God. Then we go to verse 14. It says, not only was it God, but he made himself flesh and dwelt among us. We have the words of Jesus right here. We don't have just 10 little commandments. We have a whole 66 books full of truth telling us the history of how we fail, how he made a way and that we can have Jesus and his word with us always. You see, religion has gotten away from that. Religion has gotten to a place that it's all about the traditions and how we do things. We got to have, uh, you got to do this, that, and the other. You've got to have all these different uh, rituals, if you will. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table here in a minute. We do two things. We baptize. That's why we got a pool back here and we, got, we have the Lord's table. That's the two things that we do. But it's more of a remembrance and a commitment. But there are people that have these check marks. You got to do this. You got to give so much to the church. You got to you got to be a good uh, a, 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 a good servant. You got to serve. You got to work. You got to get everything right. But you see, what it is is it's not us. Religion has taken it away because we've lost our way and we don't listen to the word. Second Timothy tells us in chapter three, all scriptures breathe out of God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and the training into righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. See, religion fell when man took his eyes off of God and his word and looked at himself. God, the, the, the fall of religion got to a place. You got to go back to the garden again. Uh, Genesis 3. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Our problem is we know good from evil, but we always jump on that bad side. Because that's what our flesh is drawing us to. See, religion is not something that we can go to to correct our wrongs. It's not a place that we come on Sunday to erase all the bad we did during the week. It's a place, this is, this is supposed to be a pep rally. I hope that, that you're on the winning team, amen. We're going to win, amen. God sent his only begotten son to die for us. We're going to get to that here in a minute. But I want us to understand that we're on the winning team and we need to stop listening to what Satan in this world has told us and what religion is trying to tell people all around the world, tickling their ear, making them feel good, instead of saying, thus saith the word of God. From the beginning, God has been given warnings. Hayes said it, the song said it this morning. Uh, you know, we go back, you know, in, in the psalm we had this morning, we're to tell of the wondrous things that he's done. What is the wondrous things he's done? He's made a way that we can come back to God in a right relationship, redeemed, and know that he's coming back for us. See, what Satan doesn't want you to listen to that. He doesn't want you to take your eyes and keep them on God. He doesn't want you to keep your eyes in the Word. He doesn't want you to study your, the Word with your heart we would study God's word with our heart we might have a better understanding of it do we keep our eyes on God's word or do we follow the newspaper do we follow God's word or do we 
get our self-help books from the bookstore? Do we follow God's word or do we look to the TV? Oprah. She's always telling you how to do it. Go to God's word. The problem is we look to man so many times and we lose our way and we don't see that Satan's involved in that. Satan wants to lie to you as well as he did this to Adam and Eve. In Colossians 2 we see, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit according to the human tradition. According to the elements, uh, elemental, elemental, I'll get it out there, spirits of the world and not according to Christ, the word, God's word. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him who is head of all rule and authority. See, if we keep our eyes on Jesus, you just got to look to him. We go back to Numbers 21. Remember, the, the, they come out. They've been wandering in the wilderness, and these snakes come up, and they're biting, and people are dying. And God said, you make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And if they get bit, all they got to do is look to that bronze serpent, and they'll be healed. Ladies and gentlemen, the sin of our lives is that snake bite. When we get bit with sin, when we find ourselves struggling, when we hear Satan and we are having being drawn to the world and we lose our way, and it's because religion has told us it's, we just got to do the omni domni and it's all going to be okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the only way to get over your sin is to look to Jesus. Look to his word. Listen to his Holy Spirit. See, he died on a cross, one, to, to atone our sins. His blood was the only thing that would atone our sins. But hallelujah, three days later, he arose from the grave and he gave us power like we never knew before. See, God indwells us now and we can have that. We don't need religion. We sit here at all the time. What we need is a relationship. When I find myself struggling, I'm going to look to Jesus. When I find myself asking questions about the world, I'm going to look to Jesus. When I find myself wanting to go someplace I ought not go, I'm going to look to Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something. If you get to the place that you want to make Jesus smile more than you want to make yourself smile, you're on your way to have power over this life. And those that are in religious places and those leaders that we've talked about and how it is going to fall, we need to make sure that we're not making these graven images. This building is nothing if God's people are not in it. Amen. The self-help books, even if they're out of a Baptist bookstore, they're nothing more than words on pieces of paper if God's word's not in it. We need to look to Jesus and stop looking at religion. See, the religion of Babylon in those days was idolatry. And in Romans 1, we see it all, uh, for all, uh, all, all through they knew God, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. And I'm going to paraphrase here, but they, they started worshiping things of nature, birds, animals. And they st took their eyes off the creator of the universe and started worship worshiping the creature we got to get back to the place that we don't, we're not looking for the healer or healing. We're looking for the healer. Amen. Amen. We always want what God can give us. We always want a better way because God can give us. I just want to get a hold of God. I want Jesus. I want to feel his presence. Yes. And if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. When you just can't get anything right. You feel like your world's closing in all around you. Religion, you know, well, let's just pray about it. But when you get along with Jesus, Lord, I'm yours. I don't understand why this is happening. I asked that quite a few times because of COVID here the last couple of weeks. Lord, you've, you've kept it out of our church all the, these two years. Enrique got it, then I got it. And I'm being a good husband, I always share everything with my wife. I kissed her, give it to her. She's back in the back. I told her I didn't give it to her. I, sometimes I, I wonder why it is we don't want to have that relationship. You see, religion is good. It gives us strength sometimes. And if we come together, but get away from religion. 
get back to a relationship. See, Hayes completes me. Andy completes me. John completes me. He don't have teeth. He can't give me my teeth. But, but those of you that are brothers and sisters in Christ, you complete me. And when I come to church, it's not because I want to be in a religious place, but it's because I want my brothers and sisters with me. They complete me. They give me strength. Sometimes you just do something wrong. And I say, well, that helps me not to know no, what I shouldn't do that. But then I'm going to go help my brother or sister. You see, it's about a relationship and we join together. So we see the fall of, relations, uh, uh, of religion. We need to get back to the creator of the universe. And all this being said, point number four, the fall of Satan. Isn't that what we want? We want Satan put in his place, don't we? Hallelujah, we're getting there. We're getting to the latter parts of the book of Revelation. And we're going to see him get his place. But he will fall. In chapter 17 and 18, we're going to see the fall of Babel. And we're going to see Satan. He's going to be put in his place. Uh, you know, we, we understand the fall of man, the fall of society, the fall of religion. But God has always made it way back to him. And that was through Jesus. And I think I've made that clear. You see, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one come to the Father but by me. And we can also go back to Philippians and listen to what Paul said to the church there in chapter 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who through he, although he was in the form of God, did not count him equity, equity, equality, equal with, I'm going back to my King James trying to do that, with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Hallelujah. So that at the name of Jesus, every name shall bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth, that means everybody. Those that have died, those that haven't been born yet. Even the, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That relationship that we have with Jesus is how we see the fall of Satan. We saw it in the garden. Remember, God told Satan, I'm a, he's going to bruise his heel, but you will have a head wound. You will not survive. See, it's Jesus that brings man back to God. We saw the fall of man. God has made a way for man. John 3, 16, for whosoever believeth in the... What, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We know that verse. We quote it. That is our gate back to God. The fall of man can be nullified if we have Jesus in our lives. Don't let Satan, Satan can't destroy man because of Jesus. God has made a way for us and Jesus became man to, to right that wrong. He showed us how to live. He lived 33 years without sin. Amen. It is Jesus that brings society back to God. We see man brought back. We can see society. John 3, the very next verse, 17. For God did not send his son into the world, that society that we have all these human beings in, to condemn the world, but in the order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus. God made a way for society. You know what? When you and I become Christians, we become a society called the body of Christ. The church. So now we see the individual man. Now we have a society called the church and we come together to do the things of God and do the things to draw people back to the kingdom of God. And it's Jesus that brings religion back to God. How we honor him, how we worship him. And we go down to verse uh, John 3, verse 21. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. You see, if we as individuals accept Jesus and we come back to God, we become a part of a society, the church. And when we as a church go out into the world and do things according to God's word, the righteousness, and we do it, we go to the truth in that light that is only found in Jesus, then we are bringing people back to God. Satan fails to destroy religion because of Jesus. We're filled with the Holy Spirit to complete God's purpose. That's what we read in Romans 8, 28. So I asked you earlier, what do I know about the fall? Hopefully you know the root where it causes and how we fail. 
We saw the fall of man. We have seen the fall of society. We've seen the fall of Satan or uh, 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 religion. But we need to see and search for the fall of Satan. Our lives should be for that cause. Jesus came to see, he sit to seek and to save that which was lost. It's not just our lost soul, but those things that were lost to Satan there in the garden. And have they progressed down through time as we see a snowball effect on how we find ourselves in 2022. But Jesus is still the answer. Jesus will still give us everything that we need. So my conclusion to this whole understanding the fall the fall did and continues to happen today. Don't have to really question that, do you? However, because of Jesus, we can be picked back up. He'll lift us up. He'll place us on the solid rock. He'll give us that ability. And I love that word. He establishes us. Are you established? Do people look at you and say, they're one of those Christians? Or better yet, they know Jesus. Can you say that? Can you go into your community and they know that you're different? You're not of this world. Isn't that what the passage said that Peter said? We're just sojourners. We're just passing through. We're pilgrims. Our home's in heaven. I'm looking forward to that day. I, I'm sorry. I mean, I love you and I missed you. But if the Lord had it taken me home, you wouldn't have got me to come back. Amen. You wouldn't have got me to come back. Once I see Jesus, I'm done with y'all. Because I got the real thing. But see, he's in heaven. He's preparing a place for us. But now I can look to you. We're the body of Christ. It's our job to manifest Jesus. Do people see Jesus here at First Baptist Church? Let's do our part. Let's go out and reach the lost. Tell somebody this week that Jesus loves them. Tell them you love them. Then tell them Jesus loves them. And the reason why you can love them is because Jesus is in you through the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Hopefully you understand the fall a little better. But we don't have to stay in a fallen state. He resurrected Jesus three days later, right? He resurrected you. That's the reason why we call ourselves born again. Hallelujah. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We're revived. We're alive. And we're going to do what it is that God has so plainly told us to do. That is to multiply, to replenish, to show dominion over Satan and the rule of this world. Go back to Genesis. He's never changed what he wants us to do. Let's do our part. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your love, your patience with us. We thank you for your, just, just everything you've given us. You've always given us a bridge. You've, you've given us your son, Jesus. And, and Lord, I'm glad I'm, I'm part of the church age. I'm glad that Jesus has died for my sins. I'm glad that I've accepted that. He is the Lord of my life and I'm glad. But Lord, let me not take my eyes off of Jesus. Let this church not take our eyes off of Jesus. Let us be strengthened. Let us be established. Let us be that which you have uh, commanded us to be. And that is to do your sovereign will. To fulfill your purpose. And that is to show dominion over this world while we're here. We love you. We thank you. Now just give us strength. Give us that, that earning that we would be drawn to Jesus. That we would always want to make him smile. Let us learn your word. Let us study your word diligently. That we might know you better. Your scripture says, let this mind be in you that is also in Christ Jesus. Let us think like Jesus. Let us see the lost. Let us see the sick. Let us see those that need your touch. And let us do our part. And Lord, there may be somebody here today that doesn't know Jesus. I pray before they leave this place that they would get saved. Let us take the Bible and show them all they have to do. Just a few verses. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do here today through your Holy Spirit. And we ask this all in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.